Hey folks, today we're going to do book 21, the test of the bow. Uh, we're skipping book 20, but nothing really of consequence happens in book 20 aside from some reading of omens and some foreshadowing about what's to come, but we've already had enough of that, so I think that we're, we're safe to skip that one. Um, this is what we've got as a summary here in the text. In books 18 to 20, Odysseus observes the suitors and finds that two in particular, Antinous and Eurymachos, are rude and demanding. Penelope asks Odysseus the beggar for news of her husband. He says he heard that Odysseus is on his way home. Penelope, however, has given up hope for Odysseus's return. She proposes an archery contest to the suitors with marriage to her as the prize. Uh, she enters the storeroom and takes down the heavy bow that Odysseus left behind. So um, if you recall the archery contest, uh, the idea here is that there are a bunch of axes and they're all lined up, and uh, th you can see that it's been represented in different ways. Here's some axes with like a circle on top, and here's these ones with the circle and the handle. Um, we saw this one, I think, is probably the, you're shooting through like the curve of the axe. Um, then there's um, this one where you got to shoot through the holes in which the haft of the axe would go in. Whatever the case, he's got to shoot through 12 small little areas in a straight line. Um, the suitors first have to string Odysseus's bow, then try and shoot one arrow through all of those axes. And whoever does it, uh, Penelope decrees, will be able to marry her. And she will go off and be with that person. Uh, it's kind of an impossible challenge. It should remind you a little bit of Atalanta and the foot race, uh, the, the impossible challenge that she's set up. Um, but now she's gone to the storeroom and she's pulled out Odysseus's bow. This is a bow Odysseus used to use. It's a really strong and powerful uh, wooden recurve bow, and um, that's the scene we're going to get here. Now the queen reached the storeroom door and halted. Here was an oaken sill, cut long ago and sanded clean and bedded true. Four square, the door jams and the shining doors were set by the careful builder. Penelope, the careful builder is Odysseus. He built this house, um, so that's that's what's being referenced there. Penelope untied the strap around the curving handle, pushed her hook into the slit, aimed at the bolts inside, and shot them back. Then came a rasping sound as those bright doors the key had sprung gave way. A bellow like a bull's vaunt in a meadow, followed by her light footfall entering over the plank floor. This is the treasure room, so it's, it's locked with a key, which is a hard thing to come by 3,000 years ago, and she had to open it. Herb-scented robes lay there in chests, but the lady's milk-white arms went to lift the bow down from a peg on its polished bow case. Now Penelope sank down, holding the weapon on her knees, and drew her husband's great bow out and sobbed and bit her lip and let the salt tears flow. Remember that this is her giving up her husband. And of course, the irony of all of that is, is very clear since her husband is in the house, and she proposed this challenge to him, and he approved it last night. Um, let's see. Bit her lip and let the salt tears flow. Then back she went to face the crowded hall, the tremendous bow in hand, and on her shoulder hung the quiver, spiked with coughing death. Now that's a metaphor for arrows. Behind her, maids bore a basket full of axe heads, bronze, and iron implements for the master's game. Thus, in her beauty, she appeared, she approached the suitors, and near a pillar of the solid roof, there she is with the bow. It's like a European representation, which we've talked about earlier. Um, she paused, her shining veil across her cheeks, her maids on either hand and still, then spoke to the banqueters. My lords, hear me. Suitors indeed, you commandeered this house to feast and drink in day and night, my husband long gone, long out of mind. You found no justification for yourselves, none except your lust to marry me. Stand up then. We now declare a contest for that prize. Here is my lord Odysseus's hunting bow. Bend it and string it, if you can. Who sends an arrow through iron axe helv sockets, twelve in a line? I join my life with his, and leave this place my home, my rich and beautiful bridal house forever, to be remembered, though I dream it only. So she, she says, essentially, like, whoever does this thing is going to marry me and I'll leave here and I'll always have this place in my memory, even though I'll never be able to visit it again. And then we have a little skip, and this one's, this one's fine. Despite heating and greasing the bow, the lesser suitors prove unable to string it. The most able suitors, Antinous and Eurymachos, they're the strongest, hold off. 
While the suitors are busy with the bow, Odysseus, still disguised as an old beggar, goes to enlist the aid of two of his trusted servants, Eumaeus the swineherd, whom we've met, and Philodius the cowherd, who we have not met. But the swineherd and the cowherd are both loyal servants to Odysseus. So there's there's a lot of chit chat and talk here, and the suitors are trying to bend Odysseus's bow, but it's a big, strong, recurve bow. And so in order to string it, Maybe I should, maybe we should do some images here so you can sort of picture what's going on. One second. So if you've never shot a bow before, you never shot a, a traditional recurve bow as opposed to, say, a, a compound bow, um, when a bow is unstrung, it looks something like this. The wood is all bent, you know, in an upward direction or whatever, and the job of the person who needs to string it is they have to bend, how do you, both of these back um, at the same time and then put the string. So you can see that this is the same bow. These both bend backwards and then the string is attached. And that's where the bow gets its power because these arms want to be shaped like this and you're pulling them back in the opposite direction. So they give it a force and a pull. And the suitors are trying to bend Odysseus's bow, but the bending of the bow takes so much upper body strength that they can't even bend it. And so there's this whole scene where they grease it and rub it with oil to try and loosen it up. They think it's been sitting in the storage room so long that it sort of tightened up and it's hard to bend and then they're like well maybe if we put it you know over a fire they put like water on the fire and it's steaming up and they put the bow over that water so it's sort of the steam and the heat will seep into the bow and so they're doing all these things that they can to try and force the bow to bend but they're incapable of bending it um, which shows that they they lack the strength and the skill that odysseus has um, so anyway um, while this is going on Odysseus sees an opportunity to talk to Eumaeus the swineherd and Philodius the cowherd, both of whom are loyal men to him. And as a beggar, he sees them both walk out of the house, uh, sort of disgusted with the suitors, uh, and he follows them. So two men had meanwhile left the hall, swineherd and cowherd, in companionship, one downcast as the other. But Odysseus followed them outdoors, outside the court, coming up and said gently, You! Herdsman, and you too, swineherd, I could say a thing to you, or should I keep it dark? No. Now speak. My heart tells me. Would you be man enough to stand by Odysseus if he came back? Suppose he dropped out of a clear sky, as I did. Suppose some god should bring him. Would you bear arms for him or for the suitors? The cowherd said, Ah, let the master come. Father Zeus, grant our old wish. Some courier guide him back. Then judge what stuff is in me and how I manage arms. Likewise, Eumaeus fell to praying all heaven for his return. So the Odysseus, sure at least of these, told them, I am home, for I am he. I bore adversities, but in the twentieth year, I am ashore in my own land. I find the two of you, alone among my people, long for my coming. Prayers I never heard, except your own, that I might come again. So, now, what is in store for you, I can tell you. If Zeus brings down the suitors by my hand, I promise marriages to both, and cattle and houses built near mine. And you shall be brothers in arms of my Telemachus. Here, let me show you something else. A sign that I am he, that you can trust me. Look, this old scar from the tusk wound that I got, the boar hunting on Parnassus. Shifting his rags, he bared the long gash. Both men looked and knew, and threw their arms around the old soldier weeping, kissing his head and shoulders. He as well took each man's head and hands to kiss, then said to cut it short, else they might weep till dark. Break off. No more of this. Anyone at the door could see and tell them. Drift back in, but separately, at intervals after me. Now, listen to your orders. When the time comes, those gentlemen to a man will be dead against giving me a bow or quiver. It's like, we'll be dead against, you know, but we all know the secondary meaning there. Um, we'll be dead against giving me bow or quiver. Defy them. Eumaeus, bring the bow and put it in my hands, there at the door. Tell the women to lock their own door tight. Tell them if someone hears the shock of arms or groan of men in hall or court, not one must show her face, but keep still at her weaving. Philodius, run to the outer gate and lock it. Throw the crossbar and lash it. And then we have three dots and uh, a skip. So this is Odysseus's plan. He wants to lock the serving women in their chambers so that they don't come out and, and get hurt. He wants to lock the doors to his house so all the suitors are locked in with him while he carries out the slaughter that he's planning 
Um, and it sounds like he's planning on beginning the slaughter with the contest of the bow. He saw an opportunity here um, with his wife's plan to let these guys shoot arrows. It brings a bow into the hall, the hall out of which Odysseus and Telemachus took all armor and weapons and everything yesterday. So, you know, it's sort of a prime area and nowhere, nowhere to hide. So then we get this. Odysseus the beggar asks the suitors if he may try the bow. Worried that the old man may show them up, they refuse, but Penelope urges them to let Odysseus try. At Telemachus' request, Penelope leaves the men to settle the question of the bow among themselves. Two trusted servants lock the doors of the room, and Telemachus orders the bow to be given to Odysseus. That's a pretty fair summary, but you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to jump over to the other text, and we'll read this little passage, because I think it's important to get all the details leading up to what's about to occur. Odysseus turned back into the courtyard in the beautiful house and took the stool he had before. They followed one by one, the two loyal hand, the two hands loyal to him. That's the cowherd and the swineherd. Eurymachos had now picked up the bow. He turned it round and turned it round before the licking flame to warm it up, but could not even so put stress upon it to jam the loop over the tip. Though his heart go groaned to bursting, then he said grimly, Curse this day! What gloom I feel, not for myself alone, and not only because we lose that bride, women are not lacking in Greece, in other towns, or in Ithaca. No, the worst is humiliation. To be shown up for children measured against Odysseus, who we cannot even hitch we who cannot even hitch the string over his bow. What shame to be repeated of us after us. Antinous said, Come to yourself. You know that it is not the way this business ends. Today the islanders held holiday, a holy day. No day to sweat over a bowstring. Keep your head. Postpone the bow, I say. We leave the axes planted where they are. No one will take them. No one comes to Odysseus's hall tonight. Break out good wine and brim our cups again. We'll keep the crooked bow safe overnight. Order the fattest goats Melanthios has brought down tomorrow noon and offer thigh bones burning to Apollo, god of archers, while we try out the bow and make the shot. As this appealed to everyone, heralds came pouring fresh water for their hands and boys filled up the wine bowl. Joints of meat went round, fresh cuts for all, while each man made his offering, tilting the red wine to the gods and drank his fill. Then spoke Odysseus, all craft and gall. My lords, contenders for the queen, permit me, a passion in me moves to speak out. I put it to Eurymachos above all, and to that brilliant prince Antinous just now, how wise his counsel was, to leave the trial and turn your thoughts to the immortal gods. Apollo will give power tomorrow to whom he wills, but let me try my hand at the smooth bow. Let me test my fingers and pull to see if any of the old-time kick is in there, or if thin, fair, and roving took it from me. Now irritation beyond reason swept them all, since they were nagged by a fear that he could string it. Antinous answered coldly and at length, You bleary vagabond, no rag of sense is left you. Are you not coddled here enough at table, taking meat with gentlemen? Your betters denied nothing, and listening to our talk? When have we let a tramp hear all our talk? The sweet goad of wine has made you rave. Here is the evil wine can do to those who swig it down. Even the centaur Eurythian in Pirithuis, Pirithus Hall, among the Lapithae, came to a bloody end because of wine. Wine ruined him. That's another illusion. You can look it up if you want to. It crazed him, drove him wild for rape in the great house. The princes cornered him in fury, leaping on him to drag him out and crop his ears and nose. Drink had destroyed his mind, and so he ended in that mutilation. Fool that he was. Centaurs and men made war for this. But the drunkard first brought hurt upon himself. The tale applies to you. I promise you great trouble if you touch that bow. You'll come by no indulgence in our house. Kick down into a ship's bilge, out to see you go, and nothing saves you. Drink, but hold your tongue. Make no contention here with younger men. At this, watchful Queen Penelope interposed. Antinous, discourtesy to a guest of Telemachus. Whatever guest, that is not handsome. 
What are you afraid of? Suppose this exile put his back into it and drew the great bow of Odysseus. Could he then take me home to be his bride? Do you know he does not imagine that? No one need let that prospect weigh upon his dinner. How very, very improbable it seems. It was Eurymachus who answered her. Penelope, O oh daughter of Icarius, most subtle queen, we are not given to fantasy, no, but our ears burn at what men might say, and women too. We hear some jackal whispering, how inferior to the great husband his suitor, her suitors are, can't even budge his bow. Think of it, and a beggar out of nowhere, strung it quick and made the needle shot. That kind of disrepute we could not care for. Penelope replied, steadfast and wary, Eurymachos. You have no good reputation in this realm, nor the faintest hope of it. Men who abused a prince's house for years, consumed his wine and cattle, shame enough. Why hang your heads over a trifle now? The stranger's a big man, well compacted, and claims to be of noble blood. Aye, give him the bow, and let him have it out. What I can promise him I will. If by kindness of Apollo he prevails... He shall be clothed well and equipped, a fine shirt and a cloak I promise him, a lance for keeping dogs at bay or men, a broadsword, sandals to protect his feet, escort and freedom to go where he will. Telemachus now faced her and said sharply, Mother, as to the bow and who may handle it, or not handle it, no man here has more authority than I do. Not one lord of our own stony Ithaca, nor the islands lying east toward Elis, nor... No one stops me if I choose to give these weapons outright to my guest. Return to your own hall. Tend your spindle. Tend your loom. Direct your maids at work. This question of the bow will be for men to settle. Most of all for me. I am master here. You really see Telemachus like stepping forward and, and taking on a different sort of role than he has previously. She ga and, and she recognizes it. She gazed in wonder turned and so withdrew her son's clear-headed bravery in her heart but when she had mounted to her rooms again with all her women then she fell to weeping for odysseus her husband gray-eyed athena presently cast sweet sleep on her eyes the swineherd had the honor horn bow in his hands moving toward odysseus when the crowd in the banquet hall broke into an ugly din shouts rising from the flushed young men oh where do you think you're taking that you smutty slave what is this dithering We'll toss you back along among the pigs for your own dogs to eat, if bright Apollo nods and the gods are kind. He faltered all at once, put down the bow, and stood in panic, buffeted by waves of cries, hearing Telemachus from another quarter shout, Go on, take him the bow. Do you obey this pack? You will be stoned back to your hills. Young as I am, my power is over you. I wish to God I had as much the upper hand of these. There would be suitors pitched like dead rats through our gate, for evil plotted here. Telemachus's frenzy struck someone as funny, and soon the whole room roared with laughter at him, so that all the tension passed. Eumaeus picked up the bow and quiver, making for the door, and there he placed them in Odysseus's hands. Calling Eurycleia to his side, he said, Telemachus trusts you to take care of the women's doorway. Lock it tight. I'm sorry, this is, this is um, Eumaeus. i got to put on my Eumaeus voice. Telemachus trusts you to take care of the women's doorway. Lock it tight. If anyone inside should hear the shanka arms or groans of men in the hall or court, not one must show her face but go on with her weaving. The old woman nodded and kept still. She disappeared into the women's hall, bolting the door behind her. Philodius left the house now at one bound, cat-like, running to bolt the courtyard gate. A coil of deck rope of papyrus fiber lay in the gateway. This he used for lashing and ran back to the same stool as before, fastening his eye upon Odysseus. And this is where we can go back. That's, that's what they skipped. We can go back to the other, other version um, that has the illustrations and the, the traditional pronunciations. And Odysseus took his time turning the bow, tapping it every inch for borings that termites might have made while the master of the weapon was abroad. The suitors were now watching him, and some jested among themselves. A bow lover, dealer in old bows. Maybe he has one like it at home. <laughs> An itch to make one for himself. See how he handles it, the sly old buzzard. And one disdainful suitor added this. 
May his fortune grow an inch for every inch he bends it. But the man skilled in all ways of contending, satisfied by the great bow's look and heft, like a musician, like a harper, this is a simile, when with quiet hand upon his instrument, he draws between his thumb and forefinger a sweet new string upon a peg. So effortlessly, Odysseus in one motion strung the bow, then slid his right hand down the cord and plucked it, so the taut gut vibrating hummed and sang a swallow's note. In the hushed hall it smote the suitors, and their faces changed. Then Zeus thundered overhead, one loud crack for a sign. And Odysseus laughed within him that the son of crooked-minded Cronus had flung that omen down. He picked one ready arrow from his table where it lay bare. The rest were waiting still in the quiver for the young man's turn to come. He knocked it, let it rest across the hand grip, and drew the string and grooved butt of the arrow, aiming for where he, from where he sat upon the stool. Now flashed the arrow from the twanging bow, clean as a whistle, through every socket ring, and grazed not one, the thud with heavy brazen head beyond. So, this is a great scene. Shows you the, the incredible strength that Odysseus has. All these young suitors are trying to bend this bow, and they can't. Odysseus picks it up, and he's like, bling, and then he plucks it, he's like, bling, and they all look at him like, whoa, and then he takes an arrow, and boom, shoots the challenge. So, who's worthy of marrying Penelope? Odysseus. He's the one who, who, you know, wins the challenge. So he proves his, his eligibility and his, how he deserves his wife through this challenge. And of course, at this moment, as he's doing this, there's a rumble of thunder from overhead. And that's a sign of Zeus, an omen, if you will. And so then Odysseus turns after making this beautiful shot to the suitors. Um, and he says this, Telemachus, the stranger you welcomed in your hall has not disgraced you. I did not miss, neither did I take all day stringing the bow. My hand and I are sound, not so contemptible as the young men say. The hour has come to cook their lordship's mutton, supper by daylight, other amusements later, with song and harping that adorn a feast. He dropped his eyes and nodded, and the prince Telemachus, true son of King Odysseus, belted his sword on, clapped hand to his spear, and with a clink and glitter of keen bronze, stood by his chair in the forefront near his father. And so this speech has, I guess, been pre-discussed by Odysseus and Telemachus. Telemachus hears it, puts on a sword, gets a spear, and now he's armed and standing right next to Odysseus, who has this, this great bow with a whole pack of arrows sitting next to him. And that brings us to Book 22, Death in the Great Hall. Uh, we're 22 minutes into this lecture. I want to make it about a half an hour, uh, so we'll we'll see how far into this we get, and um, you know then we'll, we'll uh, transition to the next chapter after that. Book 22, Death in the Great Hall. Now shrugging off his rags, the wiliest fighter of the islands leapt. That's Odysseus, obviously. Leapt and stood on the broad door sill, his own bow in his hand. He poured out at his feet a rain of arrows from the quiver and spoke to the crowd. So much for that. Your clean-cut game is over. Now, watch me hit a target that no man has hit before. If I can make this shot, help me, Apollo. He drew to his fist the cruel head of an arrow for Antinous, just as the young man leaned to lift his beautiful drinking cup, embossed, two-handled, golden. The cup was in his fingers. The wine was even at his lips. <laughs> I mean, you could just, this is, this is perfect. He's drinking Odysseus's wine with no care, has no idea what's coming to get him. Um, anyway, and did he dream of death? How could he? In that revelry, amid this throng of friends, who would imagine that a single foe, though a strong foe indeed, could dare to bring death's pain on him and darkness on his eyes? Odysseus's arrow hit him under the chin, and it punched up to the feathers through his throat. Backward and down he went, letting the wine cup fall from his shocked hand. Like pipes, his nostrils jetted crimson runnels, a river of mortal red. And one last kick upset his table, knocking the bread and meat to soak in the dusty blood. Now, as they craned to see their champion where he lay, the suitors jostled an uproar down the hall, everyone on his feet. Wildly they turned and scanned the walls in the long room for arms, but not a shield. Not a good ashen spear was there for a man to take and throw. All they could do was yell in outrage at Odysseus. That was a nice little illustration here. 
Um, you can see we got guys who are armed over here and guys who are not armed over here. It's exactly as Odysseus planned. Um, foul to shoot a man! That was your last shot! Your own throat will be slit for this. Finest lad is down. You killed the best in Ithaca. Buzzards will tear your eyes out. For they imagined, as they wished, that it was a wild shot, an unintended killing. Fools, not to comprehend. They were already in the grip of death. But glaring under his brows, Odysseus answered, You yellow dogs, you thought I'd never make it home from the land of Troy. You took my house to plunder, twisted my maids to serve your beds. You dared bid for my wife while I was still alive. Contempt was all you had for the gods who rule wide heaven. Contempt for what men say of you hereafter. Your last hour has come. You die in blood. At this they all as they all took this in, sickly green fear pulled at their entrails, and their eyes flickered, looking for some hatch or hideaway from death. Eurymachus alone could speak. He said, If you are Odysseus of Ithaca, come back. All that you say these men have done is true. Rash actions, many here, more in the countryside. But here he lies, the man who caused them all. Antinous was the ringleader. He whipped us on to do these things. He cared less for a marriage than for the power Cronion had denied him as king of Ithaca. For that, he tried to trap your son and would have killed him. He is dead now and had his portion. Spare your own people. As for ourselves, we'll make restitution of wine and meat consumed, and add each one a tithe of twenty oxen, with gifts of bronze and gold to warm your heart. Meanwhile, we cannot blame you for your anger. So Eurymachos is such a sniveling coward. He's like, ah, don't kill us. We'll pay you back for everything we ate. No harm, no foul. You killed Antinous. Everything's cool. Odysseus glowered under his brows and said, not for the whole treasure of your fathers. All that you enjoy, flocks or any gold put up by others, would I hold my hand. There will be killing till the score is paid. You forced yourselves upon this house, fight your way out, or run for it if you think you'll escape death. Now I doubt that one of you skins by. They felt their knees fail, and their hearts, but heard Eurymachus for the last time rallying them. Friends, he said. The man is implacable. Now that he's got his hands on a bow and quiver, he'll shoot from the big doorstone there until he kills us to the last man. Fight, I say. Let's remember the joy of it. Swords out. Hold up your tables to deflect his arrows. After me, everyone. Rush him where he stands. If we can budge him from the door, if we can pass into the town, we'll call out men to chase him. This fellow with his bow will shoot no more. He drew his own sword as he spoke, a broadsword of fine bronze, honed like a razor on either edge. Then, crying hoarse and loud, he hurled himself at Odysseus. But the kingly man let fly an arrow that instant, and the quivering feathered butt sprang to the nipple of his breast as a barb stuck in his liver. The bright broadsword clanged down. He lurched and fell aside, pitching across his table. His cup, his bread and meat were spilled and scattered far and wide, and his head slammed on the ground. Revulsion! anguish in his heart with both feet kicking out he downed his chair while the shroud shrouding wave of mist closed on his eyes amphinomus now came running at odysseus broadsword naked in his hand he thought to make the great soldier give way at door but with spear throw from behind telemachus hit him between the shoulders and the lance had drove clear through his chest he left his feet and fell forward thudding forehead against the ground so there's the three main suitors that we've run into so far all three of them dead in like in just a couple of seconds. Telemachus swerved around him, leaving the long dark spear planted in Amphinomus. If he paused to yank it out, someone might jump him from behind and cut him down with a sword. At that moment, at the moment he bent over, so he ran, ran from the tables to his father's side and halted, panted, saying, Father, let me bring you a shield and a spear, a pair of spears, a helmet. I can arm on the run myself. I'll give outfits to Eumaeus and this cowherd. Better to have equipment, said Odysseus. Run, then. Well, I hold them off with arrows, as long as the arrows last. When all are gone, if I'm alone, they can dislodge me. Quick upon his father's word, Telemachus ran to the room where spears and armor lay. He caught up four light shields, four pairs of spears, four helms of war-high plumed with flowing manes, and ran back, loaded down to his father's side. He was the first to pull a helmet on and slide his bare arm in a buckler's strap. A buckler is another word for a shield. The servants armed themselves, and all three took their stand beside the master of battle. 
While he had arrows, he aimed and shot, and every shot brought down one of his huddling enemies. But when all barbs had flown from the bowman's fist, he le leaned his bow in the bright entryway beside the door, and armed, a four-ply shield hard on his shoulder, and a crested helm, horse-tailed, nodding stormy upon his head. Then he took his tough and bronze-shod spears. And then we get an italics. Um, the suitors make various unsuccessful attempts to expel Odysseus from his post at the door. Athena urges Odysseus on to battle, yet holds back her fullest aid, waiting for Odysseus and Telemachus to prove themselves. Six of the suitors attempt an attack on Odysseus, but Athena deflects their arrows. Arrows? They don't have bows. Um, this is a bad summary, and I'm not going to hurt you anymore by reading it. Um, that's a nice image. Uh, we will not skip that. Uh, I will I will begin where we left off with the next lecture. We're already at 30 minutes here. So the next lecture, before we get to book 23, we'll finish off um, the fight, uh, and we will not deny you the rest of the action. It always bothers me when they skip the rest of the action in, in a scene. Um, we've been waiting for these suitors to get what's coming. Now it's time for them to get it, and we'll, we'll read the whole thing. Uh, all right, so that's a good place to stop. Does anybody have questions about what's going on or um, how this is, is sort of turning out? Let me know, and I will I will answer them. You can write them in the comments below, or you can unmute yourself and talk to me, any any of the above. I'm, I'm happy to um, listen and help. I do want to, I guess, one more thing. Last thing, I just I just want you to be able to picture what's going on here. We have now, Telemachus has, has gone and armed himself, and he's armed uh, the swine herd and the cow herd um, and Odysseus. And so we've got four guys that are armed as Greek soldiers, like this guy here. We've got the big round shields, the bronze helmets, the spears, which are good for throwing or for, or for stabbing. And they're all standing in the doorway, the exit. Um, the, the room itself is full of suitors. Um, there were over 100 of them. Odysseus has probably shot 50 of them with arrows, so their numbers are about cut in half. And they're all just wearing clothes, and they have swords, um, whatever, whatever sword or dagger they were carrying with them. And so you can see that you know Odysseus and his guys are still outnumbered, um, but when you're looking at equipment, when you're looking at, you know, how do you, how do you approach a guy who's got a big shield and a spear when all you've got is a sword? How are you going to, um, you, he's got reach on you, he's got the ability to defend himself, how do you block a spear thrust with a sword? Uh, so, you know, the Greeks who were hearing this story would have been very familiar with the, the combat and tactics uh, of the time period, whereas nowadays we don't really we don't consider these things are not, they're not innate knowledge and you have to stop and think about it and look at it. So, uh, you know, obviously uh, these Greeks were, were pretty powerful warriors and uh, pretty well defended. Um, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to stop there. Uh, and, and you can sort of picture Odysseus and his son and the two others standing in formation. I wonder if there's one here with their, with their shields locked because you can lock shields and form what's called a shield wall. Uh, let me see if I can, I can throw that picture up there. This one, I think, gives you the idea of the tactics where they overlap the shields and it creates sort of an impenetrable wall behind which you have the spear and you can just stab anybody who's approaching in the face or, you know, wherever they're, they're vulnerable. And that was the tactic. These guys were called hoplites and this tactic was called a phalanx. Now, generally, you, you had a lot more men than four. Uh, but this is the situation and, and you can think about this and, and how it's going to play out uh, as you wait to see the outcome of the battle next time.